All right, well, good morning, church. All right, what a great opportunity we have today to come into the house of the Lord and to lift up the name of Jesus. And just by a hand clap of praise this morning, who all is going to help us do that? Amen. All right, all right. Thank you for that. Well, my name's Jeff, and as always, it's an honor and it's a pleasure to be here. But uh, more importantly uh, than just me being up here, it's uh, what we're doing here. So as a group, what we like to do is when we sing through these songs, we don't just sing them just for no reason. You know, we sing them with anticipation that the Holy Spirit will sweep across the room and prepare our hearts for the spoken word that we know is to come. So today we have some special guests with us that are going to be showing up a little bit later. And we also have Brother Ryan that's going to bring the spoken word this morning. So what we want to do is we want to ask the Lord to come be a part of our service. We don't want to just be up here making noise for no reason. So if you will, let's stand together and uh, we will ask the Holy Spirit to come be a part and to uh, just inhabit our praises this morning. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. and Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for taking care of us and just giving us this place to come and to worship you. Dear Lord, thank you for uh, just each person that's represented here today. I pray for every note that's played. I pray for every phrase that's sung and every word that's spoken, God. I pray that they would not return void to you, that we will take these things and apply them to our lives and we'll somehow leave this place closer to you than when we entered. So dear Lord, today, if there are things that are in our life that are keeping us from becoming closer to you, pray that we lay those things down at the foot of the cross today, right now, and for the next few moments, come before you with clean hands, willing to accept the things that you're going to pour out to us today throughout the service. All these things I pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right. Would you guys mind if we clap along this morning? Can you do that with us? Can you do that?
our service. The church, you may be seated. Well, church, our God is good and he's alive. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So great to have you today. We want to make sure the microphone doesn't roll off. <laughs> it is uh, so good to be in the house of the Lord and so grateful for you. I hope you've had a good week and it's always great to gather amongst God's people. If you're a guest here with us, I want to say thank you so much for being here. You might have noticed that there is a card here in uh, hopefully near you. If you don't mind scanning that top one, it'll take you to a connection card. We would be very grateful if you filled that out for us. That will help us to connect with you as you are connecting with us. And so please do that if you haven't already. I also want to take the time to introduce the church to some new members. We'll go ahead and do that at this time. We have uh, Brother Elijah Graves. And Elijah, if you'll say hi. Elijah has uh, joined the church by his baptism a few weeks ago, and so if you rejoice in him coming, would you signify by saying amen? Amen. amen. Praise God. Also, today we want to introduce uh, Clint and Rachel Kaiser. If you all will stand and kind of wave at everybody. <laughs> Just a delightful couple, glad to have met them and, and get to know them better. If you rejoice in them coming by letter, would you signify by saying Amen. Amen. Praise God. And so God's moving and growing the church, and, and I'm thankful for our members for praying, inviting your friends. Continue to do that. This is the way we go about advancing the gospel, sharing the gospel, being mission-minded, and that's really what the focus is of today's service. We want to think a lot about missions, and as you're going to hear today, quite often, God has set apart the task of being a missionary to all Christians, Every Christian in the fulfillment of the Great Commission is called to be a missionary and to advance the gospel by sharing their faith, sharing their testimony, and making disciples. And so we're going to hear a whole lot about that today. What I'd like to do in just a moment is introduce you to uh, River of Life Ministries, and they have three representatives that are here today, and they're going to share how God has used them and when you think about these guys, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, and I hope you don't take that, but they're, they're ordinary guys, amen, right? And, and as, as we all are, and yet God has used them in extraordinary ways just because they said, yes, Lord, just because they were obedient to the Lord. And so what I want to do is I want to pray and uh, pray that God will be with us for this service and be with them as they're going to share, but also I want to make sure that, uh, that you're aware that God's Spirit is, is going to do some great things in your own heart, so I pray that you would open your heart to that. At the conclusion of my prayer, we'll go ahead and start with that introduction video to the River of Life Ministries, and then they'll come and share what God's laid on their heart. So let's pray together. Our Father, we love you today. So grateful for what you're doing. So grateful for how good you are. And we just come before you today, and we lift our hands because you are the God who saves us. You are the God who has great mercy upon us, even though we're so undeserving. And I pray, God, that you would put a bar burden on our hearts for the lost that are in our area and the lost all around the world. And I thank you for River of Life Ministries. I thank you how you've been faithful to use just ordinary people to advance your gospel to the furthest parts of the world. And I pray, God, that you would just open our eyes to how we can support them and get involved in what they're doing as a missions group. Lord, I pray you be with them as they share. Just pray you give them courage and boldness and that they would share whatever you would lay upon their hearts today. And I pray that we would be challenged with our faith and recognize that our faith is not something we are to keep to ourselves, but something that we're to pass on to as many people as we can. And I just pray today that you would have your way. And we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'll start that video. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. I um, want to say thanks uh, to all you for being here. Thanks to um, Pastor Ryan for having us. Um, yeah, we just wanted to talk a little bit about River of Life and uh, you know what we've been able to do over the last few years and what we uh, hope to continue to do. Um, River of Life, at, at the core, um, it's about three things. It's about building relationships. It's about uh, making disciples and expanding the church. Uh, at its core, it's about the Great Commission. Um, you know, obviously, um, all missions are important, and um, we are called to feed the, the hungry and to give to the poor and to build and do all those things, but at, at the center needs to be the gospel. And uh, we have been able to go, as you can see, to a lot of uh, hard-to-reach places. That is kind of what, what is at the center, is trying to take the gospel into hard-to-reach places, uh, unchurched areas. Um, and most, most often that has been for us in South America, in the jungles, uh, in Uganda, and um, God's opening doors every day uh, for more places. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, one of those three things, making disciples. And, and I was um, privileged to listen to your message, I think it was last week, Pastor Ryan, um, about making disciples. And, and I'm here to tell you that I would never find myself standing here before you today, let alone on the other side of the, uh, of the world, um, preaching the gospel, making disciples, if I had not been discipled here in America, as well as over there. And um, so I'm, I'm every day that I wake up and I know who I am and why I'm here, I'm so thankful that when I made a decision for Christ four years ago, that, that a man, a group of men took me and they, they, they brought me along and they discipled me. Um, and that's how we reach. You know, we do a lot of um, street evangelism, you know, door to door in, in the places that, like you're seeing now. There's pastor conferences that go on. Um, but all of that is used to disciple. Uh, so when we go into uh, places, um, we're always looking to disciple people. Um, so um, fulfilling the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 19, to go therefore and make disciples. Um, like I said, you know, if it were not for people pouring into me and discipling me, and, and really at a time where I did not know what they were doing. You know, I, I, when, when I came to Christ, I had no idea what I was getting into. You know, I was, I was 32 years old. I had a mess of a life, but all I knew was to say yes to, to Jesus. And, and, you know, really going back, and I say this a lot of times, and thank you for, for saying that we are ordinary men because, uh, so I didn't have to get up in here and say that, but I came to Christ thinking, I don't know what this, what this is all about, but I'm just going to try to try to be a Christian. Uh, if I would have known everything that it, uh, it would entail, um, I don't know. I don't know if I would have said yes or not, uh, but I'm so thankful that men brought me along and taught me uh, everything that, that God had commanded us, you know, to be disciples. And so um, I remember the first time that I was asked to go, I was not making disciples yet. You know, I, I would say that it was an, wasn't until after a few trips um, that it really started to sink in that this is what God has for me. This is the life that God has called you to live, Chase. And, and like the pastor said, if you are part of the kingdom, this is your calling too. We might not all go to those places there. You know, it might be uh, right here. And I love going to those places. But if God told me that I would never go back, you're going to make disciples here in America, I'm fine with that too. You know, uh, but the blessings that has been on my life just by fulfilling that simple call um, has been extraordinary. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay and, uh, and Randy. Oh, where, okay. My name's Chase Harris. I, sorry, I thought I, I said that at the beginning. Uh, uh, I do go to um, Church of the Highlands in Oxford, Alabama. And um, yeah, so now I'll turn it over to him. 
My name's Jay Beggs, and I worship at Union Lane Church. And uh, that's where River of Life kind of started for me. me. As he said, just an ordinary group of guys, a bunch of us got together and went on a mission trip several years ago and found ourselves in Iquitos, Peru. And from there, we met a guy. And I want you to understand what missions are. What they are to me is their relationships. It's no different than what your pastor does here. Your pastor develops relationships with people that leads to other relationships. And that is the same way River of Life started. It started with a man named David Chisholm that was a missionary over there that introduced us to a pastor that we made a relationship with that ultimately introduced us to a guy that had a broken heart for an area of the river, of the Napo River region, from the tip of Mazan to uh, Ecuador. And he said, nobody will go. Nobody's been, you know, nobody, the Christ, nobody knows Christ there. So we made, uh, you know, a bunch of rednecks from ball play get together and said, I'll go. And uh, so, uh, you know, God knows what he's doing when he picks people. Um, people ask us all the time, is that stuff scary? And no, if you grew up in ball play, it's not. Some drunk swinging a machete is just another Tuesday night at a party. But uh, we went up there, and as we started, we do things methodically. We tried to use Paul's vision of the way he did his missionary trips as in the first thing we do when we arrive at a new place we don't just get out and say hey the green goes are here and uh, everybody gather around we got something to say we find the authority whether it be a pastor whether it be a chief uh, oppo a mayor they call them different things there but it's usually a very smart man that's been elected to run his community and he's intelligent and what do intelligent people do when they realize something's broke we sit down and we share Jesus. We tell them why we're there. And I have yet one time to see that divine appointment not turn into a salvation, which leads to our privilege and our opportunity to evangelize his community. And we usually have big meetings at night. And uh, once we've done that, once we've evangelized, then the discipleship, as Chase talking about, that process starts. And it's not easy. We're doing it from another country. But, uh, man, God has just showed us ways. We got people over there now that speak the language. They can get in our boat for $300 worth of gas. Uh, they can go do in a week what it takes me a month to do. So it's awesome. But we keep building relationships, and we build more relationships. And he tells us about another guy in another tribe. The first time, we went probably 1,000 miles back and forth in a river. And after that, we started strategically going to places. And uh, it hasn't always been easy, and it's not always successful. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it is. One time Randy and I, Randy went with me. Y'all, I was going to leave Randy in the jungle, man. He about went out on me. Uh, he got really hot and dehydrated, and we were dragging a boat. But to make a long story short, we traveled all day up this forgotten river to a place, and nobody was there for nothing. And we're sleeping in a place that we're not supposed to be in a foreign country, in the middle of a jungle, and praying to God they don't come home in the middle of the night and see us there. And then on the way out, our boat breaks. We're stuck in a place I ain't seen a boat for two days, but God sends one. Somebody comes along, hooks to us, drags us out, because they don't want us there either. But it would have been easy at that point to say, you know what, I just don't think we're supposed to be here. I just think God meant for us to go somewhere else. We made a mistake, but that was not it at all. We went back the next year and probably had one of the most successful missions that I've ever been on in the middle of the jungle that led to another relationship. He said, there's one more tribe on this river. We traveled it the next year and probably the most spirit-felt worship service I've ever been in in my life was there in the middle of nowhere. I felt like that, almost like I need to take my shoes off. I couldn't even speak. My head was just lowered. I was weeping, something I don't do. I don't cry. I'm not a crier. But uh, the win to me on that trip, here was the win, and I want you to hear my heart. This is discipleship. Is when it was all said and done, and this young man steps up, and he gives his testimony of why he's there. Okay? I didn't know who he was. He had been with us for two days just carrying stuff, making sure the boats ran, driving the boat some. But he turned out to be the fruit of somebody we had led to the Lord three or four years ago that we never had even went back and seen. And I used to worry, y'all, when I left, what's going to happen to him now? I'm gone. God showed me that day that that's his business. I just need to do what he tells me to do, and he will handle it from there. River of Life, 
is just a bunch of ordinary guys out trying to make a difference in the world. But I want you to know that we would love to have your support. We thank you for having us at our church, letting us talk to you. We thank you, Pastor, for what he has done to be involved with us. Now, Randy's going to tell you how we do it. Thank you, Jay. Um, guys, there's um, there's probably only a I'm, of course, I'm Randy Cortez. You guys know me. This is my church right here where we are. Um, there's probably only a handful of guys um, in this building that I would go anywhere with. But there's two guys that was on the stage with me just a minute ago that I've told them thousands of miles, hundreds of miles away from here that I would go anywhere in the world with them as long as we do this one thing. And I want you to hear my heart now. I want you to hear the heart of River of Life Global Ministries, or missionaries. We, we believe in God's power, and we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the very core of our, what we believe, and that's exactly why we go. That's why we build relationships. That's why we plant churches. That's why we disciple but there's got to be a starting point. So how is it that we share the gospel? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because I'm going to show you how we share the gospel, okay? And I'm going to show you by using my hand. So if you want to, follow along. Um, Jay, it's hard for me to stand up here, especially by myself. I wish I had a Ugandan translator with me right now because y'all would see me doing laps up here sharing the gospel, okay? Because over there they call me the Ugandan pastor, or not pastor, preacher. Uh, because I like to get after it. But here in Alabama, people don't get as excited about the gospel as some people do in other parts of the world. So I don't expect you guys to jump up and down and, and, and start doing tribal dances and stuff like that. But what I do want you to do is I want you to, I want you to feel something welling up inside of you as I share. Okay? So here we go. The thumb. The thumb is good news. God offers eternal life. John 3.16 says this, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Then we go to the, the pointer finger, the index finger, right? But we don't point in judgment because if I point one finger at you, I've got three pointing back at me, right? And why is that so important? Well, it's because we have one problem, Okay. And that's sin. The Bible says all sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. So how'd God solve the problem? Through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the middle finger, the cross. Um, Christ died for you. Romans 5.8 says this. For God demonstrated his own love for you and that while you were still sinners, Christ died for you. So next we have the ring finger. Now what is this? This is... Uh, commit. Um, we uh, commit uh, our lives to Christ, okay? So I love the ring finger because it gives me the illustration of my wedding ring. That reminds me of my commitment to my love, to my wife, right? That I love her and her alone. That's exactly how we commit ourselves to Christ. He is one God, one truth, one hope, and one resurrected life. So we believe in Christ. Uh, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says this. It says, uh, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. For it's by the heart one believes unto righteousness, and it's with the mouth we confess unto salvation. So then we go to the the little finger, the pinky finger. Right here, little bitty guy, right? And that's faith, all right? What is faith? Well, we think of faith as, as the Bible says we only have to have faith the size of a mustard seed, right? Um, but here's the thing, guys. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says this. It says, for it's by grace that we are saved through faith, not by works. It's a free gift of God so that no man should boast. So then we know that when we do that, we're safe. That's the palm. Okay? Now, why is it important for us to feel safe? Well, I'm glad you asked me that question because here's what the Bible says about that. John 10, 27 through 29 says this. It says, uh, Jesus says, 
my sheep hear my voice, and they know me. And I offer them eternal life. No one can snatch them out of my hand. And my Father, who is greater than all, he gave them to me. And no man can snatch them out of his hand. So if that's the truth, guys, if, that, if that's the gospel truth, that in itself is a double layer of protection. It's a promise of Jesus, the Son of God, and it's also a promise of God that, he, that no one can snatch us out of his right hand. Right? So when we understand this, we pray and we commit our lives to Christ. Right? And how do we pray? Well, guys, you know how we pray. It's the sinner's prayer. I always share it this way, A, B, C. Admit, believe, confess. Admit that you're a sinner. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says you shall be saved. And then we see, we commit, you know, we, we confess and commit. We commit our lives to Christ. I remember October 10, 2010, when I surrendered my life to Christ. That was the day I remember saying, Lord, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. So today, tonight, it was a, it was a night, it was a Saturday night. I said, Lord, I, I commit my life to you. Now you're going to have to show me how I'm supposed to live. And guys, that's when the relationships and the, and the discipleship began in my life. The relationship began, number one, with Jesus Christ. I began reading my Bible. I started in the book of John. And three weeks later, I completed the book of John. And you know what happened in those three weeks, guys? Jesus began to identify with who I was, and I began to identify with who he is. And it radically changed my life because that was the first time at 45 years old that I actually read the Bible on my own. That I didn't have to have a preacher or, or a Sunday school teacher or anybody else convince me this is how I know what God wants me to do is by getting in his word, learning who he is, developing a relationship with him, and pursuing him on a daily basis. And I've done that faithfully for the past 12 years, be 13 years in October this year. So like, uh, like Brother Ryan said, and these guys have repeated, I'm going to repeat the same thing. Guys, if God, if, if God can take an ordinary guy like me, a guy who used to drink like a fish, cuss like a sailor, I used to tell all, everybody I was saved because I prayed a prayer and I got baptized. But here's the thing, guys. For the next 30 years after I did that at 12 years old, I didn't have a relationship with him. I was the king of my life, the Lord of my life, not Jesus. But when I started reading his word and I began that daily relationship with him, that's when he taught me how to be a better, uh, better friend, how to disciple others, and then he taught me the Great Commission, how to go, therefore, into all the world, and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and teaching them as you have been taught. And I love the promise that Jesus gives us at the end of the Great Commission. What does he say? And lo, I will be with you until the end of what? The ages or the time or the day or, or that fateful day, right? So God gives us many, many promises. I hope you saw all the promises in the Bible verses I shared with my hand with you guys because that is the gospel truth. And that, my friends, is the heart of River of Life Global Missions. Thank you for that, man. I really appreciate that. All right, church, if you will, let's stand together. We're going to continue our worship this morning. We're going to sing about how great our Father's love is for us. Amen. Beyond all measure, 
that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns his face away as wounds with the chosen Bring many sons to glory. truth in that song this morning, God, amen.
Jesus, the Son of God, hung on a cross to church and you may be seated this morning. Thank you for singing along with us and giving honor and glory to our awesome God. If you're a part of Children's Church this morning and uh, you guys want to make your way to the front, whether you're teaching or helping with that or whether you're a part of that uh, ministry in that age group, if you will, you guys come forward, exit either to the left or the right, and we'll get you where, we, uh, where you need to go. Thank you. Well, amen. And church, if you're not aware, we do serve an awesome God. Amen. Praise God. Thank you guys for sharing. I don't know where Randy ran off to, but him too. <laughs> um, it's good to have everybody here today. Let's open our Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 will be our sermon text today as we are continuing our study through this awesome, awesome book where Paul was investing his life in a young man named Timothy who was shy and reserved and timid, but God had a calling on his life to preach the gospel. And so what you see in 2 Timothy, as we have seen, is that there was a call on Timothy to not be afraid, but to recognize that God had given him a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And because of that, he didn't need to be ashamed of the gospel. He needed to have an uncompromising conviction in the word of God and an uncompromising conviction to rely on the Holy Spirit and to love everyone, even if it means that sometimes we get hurt. Last week we saw in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that the call was for Timothy to be a disciple maker who depends on the grace of God. We are strengthened by the grace of God in order to make disciples. And so with that, Paul had given three metaphors and comparisons for Timothy. He said that he is to be like a soldier, that is that he is to be courageous and have an all-in type of service to his commanding officer, the Lord Jesus. Timothy was also to be like an athlete. He was to focus on being disciplined and training himself to become more like Christ and to win the prize. And finally, as we saw last week, Timothy was also to be like a farmer, somebody that was diligent, hardworking, because there is a bountiful harvest. And so with that, let's pick up where Paul drops off here in verse 8. 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 13 is our text today, starting in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is trustworthy. 
For if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Let's pray together. Father, we love you today, and we come before you in the name of Jesus, grateful, because you are an awesome God. God, for those of us that know you as personal Lord and Savior, for those of us that have been saved by your awesome love and mercy, God, you have commissioned us to go into all the world and make disciples. And I pray today that we would take that calling seriously. Lord, this church is not a social club. We're not a civic organization. We are a church of the living God that's been purchased by your blood and set apart for that task of preaching the name of Jesus to every person on this planet. And I pray, God, that we would take that mission seriously. And that, Lord, if you would just speak to our hearts today and that we would just listen. When you ask that question, whom shall I send? God, I pray that there would be hands all over this congregation that says, here I am, Lord, send me. Whether it be to our neighbors or whether it be to the nations, God, I pray that we would be obedient to this awesome task of evangelizing and discipling your beautiful world. We love you, and I just pray today that your word would just have its way with every heart here today, and that your Holy Spirit would anoint me as I proclaim your word, and I'm dependent upon him to do what he wants to in hearts today. And I pray these things in the precious name of Jesus, amen. So here we are in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and in today's passage, Paul is encouraging Timothy and encouraging us as well how we can have motivation for missions. Sometimes I think people need motivation. If you've ever been a coach, perhaps, and you notice that one of your kids is not doing what he's supposed to do, you have to think of ways to motivate them. And so that's what Paul's doing for us. He is trying to motivate us, trying to motivate Timothy to get off the bench, to get active in making disciples, evangelizing the world, whatever God would ask him to do. And so today I'm going to give you three motivations for missions, all right? So the first of which is found at the beginning of verse 8. It simply says, remember Jesus Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Are you somebody that struggles with remembering things? It might be that you're the type of person that goes in the kitchen And then you get frustrated wondering why you went in the kitchen in the first place. Some of us have those struggles with remembering things. My wife tells me all the time, write this down or put it in your phone. The reason why she tells me that is because I can forget things from time to time. And in addition to that, I have a certain level of pride on how much I can remember. And so she likes to make sure I remember things. But the word remember is a continuous command. We are to keep on remembering because we are prone to get distracted and we are prone to forget things, right? In the book of Psalms, chapter 78, verses 10 and 11, this is a problem that Israel had as well. 78 verse 10 says, they did not keep God's commandments but refused to walk according to his law. Listen to this. They forgot his works and the wonders that he had shown them. Isn't that amazing that Israel had seen all of these amazing wonders, all of these miracles, how God was intervening and working in their hearts and in their lives, and Israel responded by forgetting. They got caught up in other things. Things distracted them. They allowed idols to come into their lives. They became worldly. And so what is Paul telling Timothy to remember. What do we all need to remember as we're thinking about missions today? And the answer is there, as I said in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. It is so key that we do this. And so how are we going to remember him? Well, we need to remember what he's done and then remember who he is. And so let's look at remember what he's done. The greatest motivation for missions is the hero of the gospel, Jesus Christ. The hero of the gospel is not you that you walked an aisle or that you got on a knee. The hero is Jesus. It is only because of Jesus that we have salvation. Recognize that Jesus lived a perfect life, 
died on the cross, shed his blood for you. He is the hero of the gospel. And so if you ever get discouraged, or if you ever feel defeated, we are to fix our eyes above. We are to remember Jesus. I love that phrase, remember Jesus. It sounds like a war cry, like, remember the Alamo. Well, I, I'm not in Texas, so it, it'd be like saying roll tide or, or war eagle, right? And if those are not your teams, go team. What, what, whatever you say, whatever's your war cry, right? And there are times where you just want to chant that and you want to holler that because you're excited about the atmosphere and the environment. And so Paul is telling Timothy, get excited about Jesus Christ. Remember him. It is so worth it. Paul says to remember Jesus. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says that we lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And then he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And then he says, looking to Jesus or fixing our eyes on Jesus. And so I want you to know today that if your eyes are not fixed on Jesus, you're going to do everything but missions in your life. You're not going to be concerned about evangelizing to your neighbors, your coworkers, your family and friends. You're living for yourself and in your flesh. And so Paul tells Timothy, telling us today, remember Jesus. And so what does he say about him? He says, remember Jesus Christ in this first phrase, risen from the dead. Risen from the dead. In other words, Jesus is alive. This verb is in the perfect passive, which means that he was raised and he continues to live. There were other resurrections that you can see in the Bible. Lazarus rose from the dead, but you know what happened later on? He died again. There were other people that were raised from the dead, but then they died again. But Jesus has risen from the dead, and he is still alive today. And because he's alive today, we are alive in him. We have that victory. So Paul is telling Timothy that Jesus died for your sins. He rose from the grave. That grave is empty. He's alive. In other words, Timothy, you are not alone. The resurrected Christ is has saved you and has risen from the grave and he is with you every step of the way as you're evangelizing, as you're sharing your faith, as you are discipling, as you're ministering. Remember, Jesus is with you. That is your power. That is your hope. The Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is also in vain. So keep that in mind now. If Jesus was not alive, we would be just going through a bunch of religious motions that make no sense. We would be singing songs to someone that's in the grave. But because he is alive, we are singing to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, who has defeated the grave, and he's worth worshiping. He's worth singing to, and he's worth going to all the ends of the earth, sharing the gospel with anyone that will hear us. He is alive. That is what he's done for us. He died for us, and he rose from the grave. But let's look at not only what he has done, but let us also remember who he is. Who is Jesus? Now that's an important question. Notice what Paul tells Timothy in verse 8 as we continue. He says, risen from the dead. And then he says, the offspring of David as preached in my gospel. So this phrase, Jesus Christ, the offspring of David, what does that mean? It means that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of Scripture, including the Davidic covenant. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, if you were interested in looking at that, what you see is an awesome God going to somebody who loved God with all of his heart. His name was David. And he came to David. David was not a perfect man by any means. But he came to David and said, I want to make a covenant with you that there would be an everlasting king on your throne. And Jesus is that one that fulfilled that Davidic covenant. In other words, Paul is telling Timothy that we're serving a king who will always be king. There is never going to be a point where somebody kicks him off of the throne or uh, betrays him or anything of that nature. He is alive and he is forever alive and forever the king. So Paul's telling Timothy that he's the greatest king that you could ever serve and one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him to be Lord. Remember who he is. He's risen, he's alive, and he's the king. Remember Christ Jesus. 
That's our first motivation. So think about your own life, maybe this past week. Maybe you've had some bad circumstances. Maybe you've been tired. Maybe life is just weighing you down. Maybe you're anxious about a lot of things. Paul is telling us that same thing today. Remember Jesus Christ. You have a mission. And that mission is for us to do missions. It's just that simple. That's what God has set us apart to do. And so if you're struggling right now for motivation, remember Jesus Christ. Let that be your war cry. Amen? For four or five of you. Secondly, we have a second motivation here. And we're going to get up to maybe six or seven after this, I hope. But the second motivation is found in verses 9 and 10. And it is this, that lost people must hear the gospel. Lost people must hear the gospel. This should motivate you. If that doesn't do anything to your heart, let me just be as honest as I can. Loving you as I'm saying this, there's something wrong with your spiritual condition if that statement does not bother you. Lost people must hear the gospel. So what can we consider about this? As you look in verse 9 and 10, Paul says, for which, that is for Jesus, for this gospel, I am suffering Bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. And so let's talk about that a little bit. We need to remember the power of the gospel. Remember the power of the gospel. In verse 9, he speaks of the fact that he is in a Roman cell. And it's dark, and it's cold. Rats are probably running around everywhere. He's basically alone, chained to a prisoner. And, and maybe Paul, as he is writing this letter and thinking about everything going on in Timothy's life, maybe he looks at his own chains. Maybe he's looking at the shackles that are on his feet. And he's not saying, I want you to be sorry for me, but instead he's saying, listen, I might be bound, I might be imprisoned, I might be chained, but the word of God, oh no, it's not chained, it's not bound, it is not in prison. No time in history has the gospel ever been chained down. There's no power on earth or in hell that can shackle the word of God. The grass might wither and the flowers might fade, but the word of God will stand forever. There have been people who have tried to eliminate copies of scripture throughout history, and yet still here, 2,000 years since the time of Christ, we are still preaching the word of God. That's a pretty incredible thing to think about. God's word, it does not return void. And so Paul is telling Timothy to trust in the powerful word of God to do its work. It will not return void, just preach it faithfully. It is not chained. Even if we're chained and imprisoned, God's word is never chained. Martin Luther, a hero of the faith during the Reformation time, wrote many, many songs. And probably his most famous one is a song called, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And listen to the lyrics. I'm just going to read one short little line here. He says, the body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I want you to think about that for a minute. This body it's eventually going to be gone. Yeah, it's, it's, it's eventually going to die off. But even after me, even after all of us, God's word's going to continue. Your great, 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 great grandchildren, if Jesus doesn't come back first, God's word's still going to continue. And so Paul's telling us, Paul's telling Timothy, invest your life in something that matters. The word of God abideth still. So remember the power of the gospel. It's never chained down. And also here, as we think about lost people here in the gospel, this motivation for missions, we need to endure whatever it takes. You notice in verse 9, he says, for which I am suffering. For the gospel, for Jesus, yes, but in addition to that, if you look in verse 10, he says this, therefore, I endure everything, notice this phrase, for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So what Paul's telling Timothy here is that there are people that don't know Jesus. And if me being bound, if me being in prison or suffering, if that is something that God needs to use to get the gospel to them, then chain me up, put the shackles on my feet, Take away whatever freedoms I have because I would be willing to suffer whatever it takes for one person to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. 
Now, the amazing thing about this is, is that God says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that it's not his will that anyone should perish. So Paul reflects the heart of God. If you want to have the heart of God, you're going to love souls. Because God loves souls. How do you know that? Because God loves your soul. God did whatever it took by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins. And Paul's saying, if I have to suffer a little bit, this body they may kill, but God's truth abided still. I'm going to allow myself to suffer if it means the gospel might continue to advance. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Listen to me, church. They cannot believe, the lost cannot believe in the gospel as long as we're silent. As long as we're ashamed, as long as we keep our preaching within our church on Sunday mornings, they're not ever going to hear. And I know some of you might say, well, I'm just going to live a good life, and they're going to notice Jesus in me. Okay. Well, that's a start. I'm not being critical. That is a start. But let me ask you a personal question. How many of you went to Christ like that? Here's what I want to invite you to recognize, that God is telling you that you have an awesome purpose in him. Don't treasure your body so much. Don't treasure your life so much. It is about the advancement of the gospel. Be willing to endure whatever it takes. These people need Jesus. So we have friends, families, neighbors, co-workers that are all around us that do not have a relationship with Christ. There are people in cities, villages, tribes, all nations of the world that have very little gospel witness. These people need Jesus. Love means giving yourself away. That's what Paul does here. He says, I love those people, and if it means I have to be put in prison, if it means I have to get my head chopped off, love gives myself away. So he does that. Do you you see that here? And here's what I want you to get, that if you love Jesus, his love comes inside of your heart, so you're going to love people. And you're going to be concerned about the fact that lost people go to hell. That should bother your heart. And you should want to pray about that. You should want to do something about that. And Paul's encouraging us here in the scripture, you don't have to be ashamed of the gospel. So the question I would have to you is this, that since love means giving away your life, are people worth it to you? Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Now I know some of you are going to think, well, if I surrender and I start being one of those evangelists or one of those people who share the gospel, God's going to put me in a village somewhere in Africa. He might. But if it's for one, isn't it worth it? Don't you want to be obedient to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant? That's what I want more than anything else. God's put me here in Hoax Bluff, Alabama. You think I knew where that was before here? I didn't, but I'm a missionary here, and I'm going to be here as long as God wants me to be here. So that's why we are saved to be missionaries, be willing to do whatever it takes. So this is a great motivation. Lost people have to hear the gospel, and we've already seen that Jesus Christ is the risen Christ, the risen Lord, but thirdly today, a third motivation for missions is found in verses 11 through 13, and it is that God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to his word. This is our third motivation for missions. God is faithful. The Bible says in Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So no matter what you've gone through in your life, understand this anchor of the soul. This is something you can cling to no matter how hard your circumstances get. God is faithful. That never changes. He is faithful. And so what I want to share with you today is that God's faithful to reward those who have faithful service to him, but he's also faithful to judge those that deny him. And so what you see in verses 11 through 13 is a a familiar creed or a first century hymn that they might have sung. These words that Paul quoted off of Timothy, he had memorized already. Timothy did. Timothy knew these words, and Paul's reciting them to him in Scripture here for us to see and how important it is to recognize that our God is faithful. So to begin with, God promises to reward faithful service. 
He promises to reward faithful service. The first two couplets that you see there, if we've died with him, we're going to live with him. If we endure, we're also going to reign with him. There's a positive ending. We're going to live, we're going to reign. Those are positive things, right? These verses explain how Paul could look at the face of death so calmly. And the reason he could is because he had already died. He had already died. Now, not physically, but he knew that when Jesus died, he died. The Lord not only died for us, but he died as us. When Jesus died, we died. When he was buried, we were buried. When he arose, we arose. We deserve death, hell, and the grave. But because of the grace of the Lord Jesus, we don't get anything we deserve for those that are in Christ. And so it starts by us dying to ourselves. The Bible says in Romans 6, 8, now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. The old man has passed away. He's gone. He's dead. The new man has come. That's who you are in Christ. You're a new creation in Christ. And so here in verse 11, he says, if we've died with him, what does it mean? We're going to live with him. That's the promise of God. If you know that you're dead, the old man is dead. If you know that that's happened in your life, you know that one day you're going to live with him. That's a promise of God. So Paul's telling Timothy, remember those promises because they're true. You're going to be rewarded. You're going to be with Jesus. And then he says another couplet there in verse 12. If you endure, this reminds me of Romans 8, 16 and 17. It says in those verses, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Now don't skim through these words, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Don't miss that. The call to our sanctification requires suffering. You say, well, that sounds terrible. Why in the world would I sign up for something in which I suffer? And the answer is, is because you recognize that it's worth it. Paul says here in verse 12, look it for yourself. If we endure, that is, if we endure suffering, if we patiently go through hard times, difficulties, persecution for the sake of the gospel, what happens when we endure? We're going to reign with him. Now that's glorious. That's a glorious promise of Scripture. And so Paul's telling Timothy, here's some positive things that you can count on. As God is faithful, you can believe in these truths that if we die, we're going to live. If we endure, we're going to reign. Take that to the bank, Timothy. God is faithful. But there's some negative consequences for those who don't. And we see that in verses 12 and 13. The call of the gospel is for us to endure for the sake of the lost, to remember Jesus. But in verse 12, we see this second promise that God promises to judge unbelieving sinners, not only to reward faithful service, but to judge unbelieving sinners. So what do you see in verse 12? The second part says, if we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful. So God promises that those who are unbelieving will be judged. Titus described them in chapter 1, verse 16. He says that these people profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. These are individuals that are apostate. That word means that they know all the facts. You can give them a quiz about Jesus and they would maybe get a hundred on that quiz. They know Bible, but yet they don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. They turned and walked away and they wanted to live their lives the way they wanted to live their lives. They don't want to give their lives for Jesus or for the lost. They want to live for materialism. They want to live for the world. They want to live for sensual pleasures. They want to live for idolatry. They know the truth, but church, hear me now. If you say you know the truth, but your life is not committed to following Jesus, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You are denying him, and the scripture is very clear here. If you deny him, read for me out loud, church, what's going to happen? He will deny you. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10. 
Verses 32 and 33 says, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. So there's something about having a relationship with Jesus that you're unashamed to tell other people about it. A silent Christian is an oxymoron, right? So look what it says in verse 33, though. Whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So these verses, verses 11 through 13, they speak about God's character. He always acts in conformity to his nature. He's always good, always faithful. He will give life in the privilege of reigning with him for those who live for him, for those who deny the world and give themselves over to Jesus. But he also, this is the promise of scripture, this is the warning, if you deny him, If you're faithless, that word faithless means unbelieving. If this is the way you want to live your life, and I'm not talking about one isolated incident, the pattern of your life is continually denying Jesus and living for yourself. If that's you here today, hear what the scripture says. He's going to deny you. Depart from me. I never knew you. So these are motivations for missions. So let me ask you a few questions here. Is your life enduring anything for Christ? Or does your life continually deny Christ? Paul's telling Timothy this very simply. God's faithful. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. He's going to give life and reward and and those who who believe and uh, those who endure, they're going to reign with him. That's his promise, but the warning is also there too. God will judge those who deny him because they don't have a relationship with him. They are still in their sins. They might know all the facts, but they don't know him. They might know about him, but they don't know him. So at this time, I want to invite the musicians and counselors to come to their places. We're going to have a time of response, but I want to put those motivations for missions on the screen. There it is there. So read those truths. What does that do to your heart? Does that make you want to say, here I am, Lord, send me? Or does that make you want to look at your watch and say, I can't wait to eat? You know, where's your focus here? Let's think about these motivations. Jesus is the resurrected Christ. We don't serve a dead God. He is resurrected. Secondly, lost people must hear the gospel. They don't go to heaven when they die if they've never met Jesus. That should have a burning impact on your heart. And thirdly, God is faithful to his word. If you're faithful, he's going to fulfill those promises. Well done, my good and faithful servant, right? But he's also faithful to share those. Those people who've never heard, those people who have rejected him, those people who have gone apostate, those people who have demon knowledge. Demons know about demons know that there is a God, but they refuse to surrender. There are people, scores and scores of people in churches today that have that kind of faith. They know all the facts, but they refuse to surrender. God is faithful to his word. Today you've heard, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing. So you've heard, but how are you going to respond? As I've said over and over again today, it's not enough to merely have head knowledge. It's not enough merely to go through religious motions. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? The three guys that were up here on the stage, they all have awesome testimonies about what Christ has done in their life. And I don't know if you heard what Brother Randy had said a moment ago, but he said, I went through the motions for years and years and years, but I didn't know Jesus. I knew all the right words to say. I knew all the Christian lingo, but I didn't know Jesus. I didn't surrender And had he died before that time, God is faithful to his word. He would have said, I deny you. Church, I love you, and I don't want that to happen to anyone here in this room. So what I want to do is invite you to pray with me. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. It doesn't matter what you think anyone else is going to think. It's between you and God right here. So let's all bow our heads. 
close our eyes. And if you know today that you're not saved, would you just pray after me? Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know that my sin separates me from you. I know that I deserve death, hell, and the grave because of my sin. But I also believe in what you tell me in the Bible, that you love me and that you prove that love by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. God, I believe. I'm repenting of my sin and I'm asking Jesus to save me right now. I believe he died for me. I believe he is risen from the grave and I believe he's the only way. Jesus, please save me today. Help me to live for you. I surrender. I wave the white flag. I'm tired of pretending. I'm going through motions. And I want to have a relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it from your heart, as we have this time of response, I want to invite you to come. I want to invite you to come to the altar. And you might say, well, what's everybody going to think? I'll tell you exactly what everybody's going to think. We're going to think hallelujah. It doesn't matter who you are, what teams you've served in on the past, how long you've been a church member. If you know Jesus right now and you asked him to save you, come to him. But as we're thinking about missions, and you've thought about those motivations for missions, I'm wondering today, I'm just going to open the invitation, if there's anyone in this room that wants to make that step of commitment to vocational missions, that maybe God has spoken to your heart and said, you need to go and serve me to the uttermost parts of the earth. And you may not know what that looks like. You may not know where you're going to go or what it's going to cost you, but you just want to say, yes, Lord, that's what I want to do. If that's you here today, I want to invite you to come as well. This invitation that we're going to have is a time for you to pray. The altars will be open. It might be that there's a huge burden on your heart. You need to just give over to the Lord. It might be that you want to pray and repent over your lack of concern for the lost. And it might be that you have a question about church membership or baptism, and you need to come as well. So let's all stand together. If you pray to receive Christ, if God's calling you to missions, whatever God has spoken to you, this is a time for you to come. I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to be up here in the front and let God do his work. But come to Jesus now as we sing. All my words fall short And I've got nothing new And how could I express All my gratitude And I could sing these songs As I often do Every song must end, but you never do. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. It's all that I have is a hallelujah. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got a
soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Church, at this time, we are going to have a very special time of prayer and consecration for those that are serving. This weekend, 